Cows have rapidly moved into the crosshairs of climate change and diet. Dr. Frank Mitlerner of UC Davis says much if most of what you think you know about ruminants and climate change is inaccurate. His findings align with those of climate scientist Dr. Miles Allen, an IPCC contributor and Oxford professor who says the global warming potential carbon equivalency formula when applied to livestock is incorrect. Both Mitlerner and Allen point to the impact a stable or declining herd has on methane production. Add in improving dietary and animal husbandry practices along with methane capturing systems and the picture in North America and Northern Hemispheric countries for cattle ranching is positive. We invited Dr. Frank Mitlerner to join us for a conversation that matters about cows, cattle, the environment, and how we can't live without ruminants. Conversations That Matter is a partner program of the Center for Dialogue at Simon Fraser University. The production of this program is made possible thanks to the following and viewers like you. Please become a patron at conversationsthatmatter.tv. Dr. Mitlerner, welcome to Conversations That Matter. As you know, cattle are in the spotlight right now, and I'm concerned they're getting a bad rap. Are they? Well, I don't think it's uh, it's a black and white, black or white um, issue here. I think that uh, there are many different nuances around livestock. Uh, they they clearly fulfill some uh, bio system services and ecosystem services that are very positive, but they also have impact environmental impacts that uh, are detrimental. And so uh, the question is always how. We manage them how we house them how we manage them and so on and uh, if we do it well then uh, the impacts are low so are we doing it well and i ask that because the message is that ruminant livestock are devastating to the environment you know that's a message that runs contrary to what i understand about grazing herds and their role in enhancing the environment and producing food from lands that are not suited to grow human food in other words how important are cattle in keeping the environment healthy? Well, ruminant and livestock are actually extremely important <laughs> with respect to human food supply. And, and uh, if I may, I just give you a little depiction of this, okay? Imagine this sheet yeah. of paper here being the entire surface of the earth. That's all of it, 100%. Now, um, I fold this sheet of paper and I will fold it twice until it's roughly the same size as a postcard. What you see now is roughly uh, the total amount of land in the world. The rest is water and ice. That's all land in the world. Now this year is my business card. The equivalent amount of my business card is all agricultural land. So this here is all land. This is all agricultural land. And if we now take this agricultural land, and we fold it into one piece that's one third and the other two third, and then rip this business card into pieces. Then we have a agricultural land mass that's two thirds marginal land. And marginal means here you cannot grow crops because either the soil is not of good enough quality or there's not enough water. Um, that land is referred to as marginal land. Okay, so two thirds of all agricultural land in the world, but also here in North America, is marginal, cannot be used to grow crops. So what do we do with that land? we graze ruminant livestock there. And why? Because they can make use of cellulose-rich feeds. Cellulose is a carbohydrate. They're the only ones that can digest that. Humans and monogastric animals like pigs and poultry cannot. So two thirds of all agricultural land are marginal, can only be utilized by ruminant livestock. The remaining one third of my business card is what's called arable land. Here you can grow crops for humans and animals. So that's how limited we are with respect to total land in the world that can be used to grow food for people. If we were to forego the use of ruminant livestock, we would throw away two thirds of all agricultural land to feed people. And not to leave out the role cattle play in greenhouse gases. Contrary to popular narratives about cows and GHGs, Cattle methane emissions are not being calculated accurately when it comes to global warming potential. 
Yeah, so first of all, methane indeed is a potent greenhouse gas. There's no discussion around that, okay? It's about 28 times more potent than CO2. Um, but it has other characteristics that make it special and different from the other greenhouse gases. So, for example, CO2, carbon dioxide emitted by all fossil fuel use activities, um, is accumulating in the atmosphere. Every time we burn oil, coal, gas, we are adding new additional carbon into the atmosphere. Because that oil, coal and gas was stored in the ground for hundreds of millions of years, now, over the last 70 years, we've taken about half of all that fossil fuel that was down there for so long. We are burning it, and that's a one-way street. It's very different with respect to biological methane. The so-called biogenic carbon cycle is one where, um, or which, starts with photosynthesis. Okay, So you have plants. These plants need sunlight, water, and carbon, and they take that carbon out of the air. Plants take carbon out of the air. During photosynthesis, they make that carbon into carbohydrates, such as starch or cellulose. And now that grass is on that, and the, on that pasture, a cow comes along, eats that grass, and then converts a relatively small portion of the carbohydrates into methane, CH4. But that methane is not new carbon added to the atmosphere, but it's recycled carbon, because that same carbon molecule used to be CO2. Now it's methane, and what's special is this methane, while it's potent, stays in the atmosphere for only 10 years. Because in sharp contrast to other greenhouse gases, methane is not just produced, but it's also destroyed, almost at equal rates. So if you have constant cattle herds, let's say, then the amount of methane produced by those animals and the amount of methane that's destroyed in the atmosphere through a process called oxidation, are in balance. Stable herds, stable herds, do not add additional carbon to the atmosphere. They do not add additional methane to the atmosphere. Hence, they do not add additional warming to our climate. And that's what uh, Professor Allen has uh, discussed with you the other day. The way that we are currently quantifying the impact of stable herds on climate is exaggerated by a factor of four. What we don't want to do is grow those herds and therefore produce new additional methane. We don't want to do that because that would be negative. But if we decrease methane, miraculous things happen. Because if we decrease methane, we are pulling carbon out of the atmosphere. Similarly to planting trees that pull carbon out of the atmosphere, reducing methane also reduces carbon from the atmosphere, having a net effect called negative warming or cooling. So reducing methane has a cooling effect, and we can do just that, and we have shown it over the last few years. One of the other things I understand about large grazing ruminants is the role they play in maintaining the health of grasslands. It's my understanding that without these large animals, the grasslands would suffer. So if that's the case, why not just leave cattle to graze in the field and not bring them into the feedlots for finishing? So, first of all, most parts of North America um, where animals graze, animals have grazed all along. Okay, So, before domesticated uh, bovines ate there, grazed there, it was uh, bison, it was antelope, and so on. And in similar numbers, by the way. So, for example, we have approximately 100 million beef and dairy cattle in the United States today, we used to have around that many bison and antelope roaming the same areas, okay? So over the last two, three hundred years, there's not much change with respect to enteric emissions from ruminant animals in North America. And that's not just the US, also Canada. So your question, shall we only graze animals? So uh, I don't have the specific numbers for Canada, but the numbers for the United States are the, the following. We have 750,000 ranches in the United States, 750,000 ranches, and we have 1,400 feedlots. All beef cattle in the United States are on pasture for at least two thirds of their life. Okay, all of them. It is the last four months that they go into a feedlot to be finished, that's what it's called. And finishing yes. refers to putting marbling meaning intramuscular fat into their meat, okay? So that's the last four months. That 
finishing phase is objected by some people, but it is appreciated by the vast majority of people because it enhances the flavor toward the palate of what people are used to and what they prefer. They prefer that feedlot finished, that corn finished beef because the animals when fed and finished that way are about half the age when they go to slaughter. That's, that makes the meat way more tender while having fully matured. It also changes the, the taste of the fat. It changes the color of the fat. If you do taste panels of a thousand people, I guarantee you the vast majority of, you, of them will tell you that they prefer the corn versus the grass finished. Now, from an ecological perspective, shall we finish animals on pasture? Well, I don't think we have enough, with, enough land to do that with. Uh, but in general, it mm. could be done. Theoretically, it could be done, could be done. Um, but it would not satisfy um, the preference of the majority of people consuming beef. I recently read that new research indicates the density of the methane a cow produces when eating grass is higher than when they're eating grains in the feedlot. Is that true? Yeah, that is actually true. So, but there's uh, additional nuance. Okay, it gets complicated quickly. But let me explain. Yeah. So the majority, the majority of methane from a, from a steer, a heifer, the majority of that methane comes from the rumen of that animal, that first stomach, which is about fifty gallons in volume. So approximately the volume of your bathtub at home. Okay. <clears throat> um, they need that large rumen uh, in, to enable the microbes that reside therein to digest the feed that they eat. So they feed a cellulose rich material in the case of grazing animals, because they eat grass and the carbohydrate in grass is cellulose. And um, only those microbes allow the digestion of that cellulose uh, in, the, in, the, in the feed. Um, and so that's a really good thing, right? Because otherwise, without those microbes, we could not make use of all of that land, of two thirds of all agricultural land, okay? Um, so, so if an animal is on pasture, then the majority of its feed is uh, the majority of its feed is roughage. Roughage, another word for that is fiber. Okay, um, so an animal that's on pasture and finished on pasture will go to slaughter around twenty six to thirty months of age. So roughly two two and a half years. An animal that is finished in a feedlot was first with its mom and then uh, with its peers, but on pasture for two thirds of its life. So roughly 10, 11, 12 months. And then it goes to a feedlot for the last four months, four or five months or so. So when these animals are around 14, 15 months of age, they go to slaughter. So you have the grass finished one that's 26 to 30 and the corn finished one that's 14 to 16. So they are much younger. Much younger animals means that they have eaten less, they have had less water to drink, they have had less time to burp, they have had less time to produce manure and so on. That's the one factor. Second factor is that those methane forming microbes that reside in the rumen thrive of roughage. They only digest roughage. They cannot digest concentrate rich feeds. And that means when you go to a feedlot and you look at the amount of rumination you see where animals lie down and they bring back the food and chew it again is very low. There's very little belching going on. There's very little enteric emissions going on in a corn rich diet, in a concentrate rich diet. So not mm -hmm. just our, not just our feedlot finished animals fed a concentrate rich diet, which doesn't lend itself for methane production. But because of this uh, accelerating process of finishing, uh, they live a much shorter life. And the combination of both, the different feed fed and the shorter lifespan, right. shrinks that carbon footprint of the, the, the corn fed animals or corn finished animals. Now, there's one more nuance to that, though. And that is the fact that we don't really know how much sequestration occurs on rangelands because that would uh, tip toward uh, the advantage of grass finished animals, because if sequestration rates were very high, meaning if the grasses that the animals eat were to pull in a lot of carbon, uh, sending that carbon through the roots into the soil. And if that soil 
accumulated carbon were at very high rates, then that would be uh, to the advantage of grass finished animals. So the final decisions have not been made. In my opinion, it takes both systems to make it complete. And it is complex. The interplay of each element in the production of food has to be appreciated before we act on single issues. You know, another topic that I keep hearing from those in the plant-based sector is about use of water. They claim that a replacement or a meat replacement burger uses less water than a meat patty. I have a bit of trouble understanding how that claim can be made. Yeah, if you would, if you invite a rancher onto your show one day, ask him what kind of water he supplies to his animals. Uh, it'll be uh, surprising, maybe most most likely that um, uh, the water that this rancher supplies his cows, uh, his cattle, uh, will be in the form of drinking water, and that's a very minor part of the overall water footprint. The major water footprint of a ranch is provided through what's called green water. And green water is a fancy word for rain. And when these people you just talked about, when they do the calculation of the water footprinting for beef, then they calculate the amount of water that went into the beef by including rain. That rain would fall onto that land with cattle present or without. Okay. When these cattle eat the forage that grows on that land, then the water goes through that animal system. And where does it end up? Will that water be gone forever? No, it will be urinated out after a few hours. So um, I understand these people want to sell their burgers or their burger replacements. I get that. But maybe they should try doing it without um, doing it on the backs of those people who work very hard to uh, provide their products. You and I have both heard the call to eliminate cattle. What would be the consequences to the world without cattle? So let me give you uh, a several prone answer to that. So uh, for example, you can compare regular dairy milk to uh, let's say almond juice, okay, a replacement for dairy milk. Um, and it's true that the almond juice would have a lower carbon footprint because there's no belching involved, there's no manure involved and so on. It might be as much as 10 times lower that almond juice versus the dairy, uh, the, the real milk with respect to the carbon footprint. But the water footprint of these almonds would be 10 times higher than that of the dairy milk. So who is there to say the one is better for the environment than the other? Depending upon whether you are in a water deprived, in a water restricted area or in a, you know, depending upon where you are, the one might be better than the other. Okay, I will not have some extremists or so. Um, uh, tell people what to consume, what we eat, what our preferences are, whether you are a vegan or carnivore or anything in between is your business. Who you vote for, who you love, what you eat in life are your personal decisions. And it's for nobody to tell you how to make these choices. That's my opinion. Now, but some people have looked at the extremes. What would happen if we were to eat more animal source foods, what were to happen if we were to eat less animal source foods? The extreme was a paper that was published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences relatively recently, um, which predicted what would happen if the entire US were to go vegan. 330 million US Americans uh, were to go vegan. That would reduce the carbon footprint of the United States by 2.6%. A meatless Monday would reduce our carbon footprint by 0.3%. Whether these numbers are high or low is up for you to decide, but these are the numbers, okay? So 2.6%. What I can tell you is when I talk to uh, representatives of this rather extreme uh, dietary choice, uh, for example, the Vegan Society of the United States, those representatives tell me about their concerns. Their greatest concern is what they call retention rate. The so-called retention rate is 84%, meaning um, of all the people who decide to go vegan, 84% stop after one year and 16% stay on longer than one year. That means for every one active vegan in this country, there are five former vegans. And that just means something must be missing. Otherwise, people would not abandon that choice. 
So for some people to say, this is the direction, this is the new gold standard that everybody should aspire to is just, uh, that's just laughable. Okay. So let's, let's talk about what people want and how we can make that happen. What they want is animal sourced foods as part of their diet. How can we make it happen? So if we go back to your business card demonstration, where you point out that two thirds of the arable land in the world is marginal. And the only way we can derive edible food from that land is, well, from ruminants that bioconvert that vegetation into protein. So if that's the case, if we remove the cattle and shift the need for food entirely onto what is left of arable land through plant-based foods, uh, do we have the ability to grow enough food for human consumption, when, especially when we compound that by a growing global population? Is it even possible to consider living in a world without cattle? I don't, I don't think it is possible. And I want to bring one more nuance to this. This one third of my business, Scott, the arable land, has to be fertilized. Half <laughs> of that arable land is fertilized with chemical fertilizers. And the other half is fertilized with organic fertilizers, which almost without exception stem from animal manure. So yeah. if you were to <laughs> subtract the animal manure, you would have to double the amount of chemical fertilizers, which is a very energy and therefore carbon intensive activity to engage in. By the way, many of my vegan students here at UC Davis, who, when I ask them, tell me they like to eat organic food, and locally grown food and so on, are unaware that if they eat organic crops, then the only reason why they can eat organic crops is because there's animal agriculture around supplying the nutrients. Because these organic crops cannot come from chemical fertilizer use. So that's just, that's just um, illustrative of how interconnected everything is in agriculture. Every farmer knows that. Most people in urban communities don't. Frank, I feel like we're only just getting started and I'm out of time. So I'm going to have to ask you to come back to continue this conversation in another episode. Thank you ever so much for your time today.